All right. Hello, welcome to the stream. This is my first black light reading hour because it's the first time when I'm doing this when I have a black light on. That's really all the only difference. It's a gimmick. It's a gimmick. Um, but if you want to see the full black light, you can tell me. I'll turn off the other light. There's a dim light over there that's giving a little bit of white light. But if you want just the black light. But anyway, welcome back to the stream or to the stream for the first time. If this is your first time. And um, I began today with a dream about the start of the semester. And in the dream, I think I started out on a bus and I had my bike, which I haven't had in years. Don't have a bike. <clears throat> Had my bike. I lost my bike. Finally got to school. Didn't know the room number. All the clocks were wrong. I was looking at my phone, and I remember it saying like 4 a.m. I was like, that can't be right, but how can my cell phone be wrong? I was very confused about the time. I was getting very distressed. Didn't know where to go. And then someone stopped me in the hallway. And they're like, ah, don't worry about it. You're close enough in time. Just to tell me something, which was... You're a leader, which was a very funny kind of like punchline to a dream. It was like, my dreams don't tend to be that obvious, but it was a pretty uh, funny punchline of just like totally a big mess and I'm a leader. And it felt like an accusation more than a moment of being celebrated or something. It was like, oh yeah, what a mess. And so I woke up, I was relieved to find out that the semester had not begun, but it did put kind of a fire under my ass today to get things going, get ready, really start, begin thinking about the semester, only a little over a week before it begins. And one of the things I wanted to think about was what would be, be reading this year and um, or this semester. And I've got a pretty good group of things that I like to read in public speaking class that I teach pretty much all the time. But I thought that maybe it might be time to rethink some of those things and switch it up a little bit. So that's what I did. And I'm still not so sure that I have hit on anything, but for the time being, I put this on the syllabus, which would be a new work for me. And I thought, why not put it on the stream and read some of it the way I will do anyway if I do end up using it in the class where I create these videos. Maybe I'll chop this one up a little bit, but um, read it on the stream and see how it goes with this black light. Okay, so um, David Bromwich, I think that's, maybe it's Bromwich. I don't, I don't know how you say the name, but... I know that he is a professor at Yale. I believe he's a professor of literature. He is kind of famous for his political commentary, which sometimes appears in the London Review of Books, which is where uh, I have come to read him. This is the first time I'm reading something actually that isn't from that or, you know, the nation or some other places that he publishes in some journalistic outfits. It's the first time I'm reading like a book that he wrote. And you can see up here, 130 pages. It's pretty short. I don't know if you can see me. I'm circling that. But um, yeah, 130 pages, pretty short. Not very long. Not assigning the whole thing. Really think I'm only going to read a chapter of it because I liked the title of, I like the title of the book, How Words Make Things Happen. And I assumed that it probably was going to be a little bit of a riff on a number of different statements from philosophers and, and poets who have said things like philosophy leaves everything as it is, or poetry um, poetry does nothing, these kinds of things. And so this, he's kind of uh, taking on both of those, actually, he's taking on this book, an argument against both the poets and mostly the literary crit critics, and in some sense the philosophers, who would say that words don't make things happen. He said words, how words make things happen, though, might be a little bit different than what we usually think, and his way of talking about it in the very first essay, which is a chapter in the book, they're all lectures. They were all delivered as lectures. So this is a collection of lectures. And I tend to really like these works that are collections of lectures from all different kinds of people. There are famous lecture series, and sometimes universities will sponsor them, or there will even be kind of like a fund set up to sponsor a lecture series, which also might be like someone's sabbatical, because they might say, take a year, think really hard about what you want to say for like six speeches and say it. And it's one of these rare places that's preserved in, it's not just in America, there are many places where there are lecture series, but in this case, um, at the University of Oxford, 
<clears throat> but where uh, people might be thinking in speech publicly. So there's one, that's one reason I like to read these lecture series. Also, they tend to be very short. And they tend to be a little bit more, as you would expect, since they're speeches, to be written in a way that is maybe not necessarily more accessible because it can still be quite heady. It can still be quite involved. The arguments might be very complicated. But that they're really addressed to a present moment. They're not addressed to a bunch of literature. They're addressed to people. And it feels a little different. And it feels a little more alive, I think, a lot of the time when you are reading lectures. Um, then when you're reading someone's kind of like, you know, I, this is the tome to end all tomes. This is my final treatment of the topic. Those kinds of things aren't quite as alive. This is people trying to say, hey, we, I got a little bit of time. What can I say? Um, doesn't mean that everyone's always going to do something great with it. But I thought I would check out what he does in this book, how words make things happen. So here's a little bit of his preface that we'll start with about what he thinks this is all about. This book is a revised and expanded version of the Clarendon lectures that I gave in the Michael Miss term. Michael Miss is like famously where you like kill a goose at the beginning of the Oxford term. And, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it refers back to an old liturgical Christian holiday that no one really celebrates anymore except at the University of Oxford. The topic grew out of a question, but it means the fall semester. The topic grew out of a question that has puzzled me from the time I began to study literature. And he's a liter literature professor, as I mentioned before. Every writer must have recognized the forts of Yeats's declarations. Declaration: Words alone are certain good. So William Butler Yeats, actually, recent speaking of the LRB, recently they did like a podcast all about Yeats, which was I thought was pretty good. <clears throat> and Yeats is a famous Irish poet. He's famous for his poetry. You might have heard some of the lines. You know, the center cannot hold, uh, turning and turning in the winding gyre. Some of his lines from his poems became famous in ways that people don't even remember. So famous that you forget where it's from. That's when you know you're really famous, when people don't recognize you. That's how famous you are. The like, they know, they know the thing that you wrote, and they're like, oh, I thought that's just something people always said. You know, that's like the greatest compliment you could pay a poet, is to forget, to know the poem and not know the poet is great. So Yeats is somebody who has that kind of stature, and he's also maybe associated with a kind of poetry that's very poetic poetry. That might seem to say all poetry is poetic. Well, you know, some poetry is kind of like, doing something different it's doing something special. his poetry really enjoys itself it enjoys being poetry doesn't mean that it's not about it's not always happy but it's enjoying the literariness the kind of texture of language it's just kind of you know it's it all feels just right you know it's that kind of poetry so it makes sense that he would be the person that would say words alone are certain good certainly good for him in his pocket you know he's selling words huh that's what you would say wouldn't you yates but what does the saying mean? Words drawn from thought and feeling. Words composed without the direct stimulus of utilitarian purpose may seem to stand clear of the mixed motives and compromises that belong to the world of action. Yeah, yeah, you're all talking a badge. Mm -hmm. a, little less a little less talk, a little more... No, a little less conversation, a little more action. That's the, one, the line I want to say. There are too many versions of that idea that I confuse them together. Admit this uncontroversial fact. However, and immediately you are faced with a challenge. Yeats meant to contrast a possible purity in words with the impurity of deeds. We, we kind of do have that bias. You know, someone who gets their hands dirty, someone who actually really does stuff, well, you're going to be compromised once you start acting. It, you can be pure when you're just talking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. You would never. <clears throat> Yet words are valued because they move us. And who can say whether or when words, thoughts, they prompt will move us to act? Some of the writers who will be considered here, Burke, Lincoln. That's kind of a turnoff for me, to be honest. It's like, but okay. Intended by words to affect the actions of their audience. Others, Henry James, Yeats himself, appeal to thought and feeling without a pragmatic interest in changing the opinions of their readers. One reason that I'm wondering over this book is because there's, there's two problems with the kinds of things that he's referencing. One, nobody knows who they are. Two, if you do know who they are, they might, might piss you off. <laughs> so, you know, I, there's something about this guy who, like, I think it might be worth teaching, not because um, he's, yeah. So I'm thinking about that, but, I'm, yeah, I'm a little concerned about some of the, the ways he's going to make his argument, I think, are very much embedded in this sense of the literary tradition that, I mean, even if it is a literary tradition, it's not everybody's literary tradition, and it's not one that's maybe that, it's not kind of at the fingertips of us today. So um, 
I feel like that might make it difficult to work with, but we'll see how I feel as we keep reading it. But I'm also curious how you feel about this. If you're here at the stream, welcome. Feel free to, even though I'm like reading a thing, this is sometimes something I do on the stream, feel free to like interrupt me and we can talk about whatever you want or talk about the reading. If you want to make a point about it or uh, condemn it or laugh at it, ridicule it, um, praise it, whatever you want to do, you can just hop in, drop a comment and I talk to people. So if you're new to the stream, don't feel like you're interrupting me. That would be a really embarrassing thing to do on Twitch. Be like, shh, chat, hush. I'm trying to read. Whoops. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, I'm looking for people to interrupt, uh, interrupt, right? Looking for that. So do not be afraid. Okay, here we go. Whoops. Hopefully you don't have motion sickness from that scroll. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, not sure about the, um, not sure about the references, but we'll we'll see how we go. But no conceptual category, no enforceable distinction can seal off language from its effects. To say it a different way, whatever an author may have meant, the consequences of language are not controlled by the author. And this is really an idea I like. It's one that I am always trying to formulate in different ways to help people because oftentimes, especially I'm teaching public speaking, I'm teaching rhetoric, different forms. People are like, well, that's not what I meant. I'm like, okay, well, it, it's not what you meant, but it is what it means when you said that. And they're like, well, how do you know? Where do you get that from? And it's a good point. It's, it's not easy to answer that question. It's a serious question. Be like, if words, if the meaning of our speech is not determined by what I want it to mean, what is it determined by? And I have, I think, a sense of that. I think probably everyone has their own sense of it. I have a sense of it that I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I still have difficulty articulating it in a way that is, is not just kind of seem weird or confused. So I'm looking for this reading to maybe help me out. So I'm, that's what I'm invested in in this reading is, is he gonna give me a clear sense of how to say that? What are the consequences of language when they're not controlled by the author? <clears throat> this is one of those things we ought to mean by the freedom of the writer. And that's already a kind of odd idea. Something's out of my control, that's my freedom, huh? We tend to imagine freedom, especially in the Anglo-American world as things that are in my control. Freedom means my ability to go and get and control and possess these things. So what could he mean if he says the freedom of the writer is in the uncontrollable consequences of her writing or speech? But it is apparently not something we want to mean. <laughs> the admission of a necessary lack of control is sure to flatter neither the vanity of authors nor the self-respect of readers. The philosophers wrote Mark in his, Mark's, Mark, Mark, my friend Mark, in his thesis on Feuerbach, have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So, I don't know if you've heard about Marx. Anyway, Karl Marx, obviously, you know who Karl Marx is. But he wrote this famous, one of his, like, his thesis on Feuerbach. I'm probably still not saying that correctly. And this is the final one. We have to act in the world, not just be kind of passive. Okay, sure, philosophers and sometimes even scientists and all sorts of brainiacs like to look at the world and describe it. Who's going to roll up their sleeves and actually do something? But, of course, Marx didn't mean, I keep want to say Mark. Marx didn't mean, oh, we should stop thinking so that we can roll up our sleeves. He wanted to see those things together, and he was borrowing Aristotle's language there when he talked about theory and praxis. Those are two words from Greek that he got from Aristotle, theory and praxis. That you, idea being that you need to have both. You need to have, understand the situation in which you're acting in order to act appropriately. But there's no value of that knowledge until you're acting. So these two things have to kind of go together. <clears throat> he spoke as a revolutionist who saw the distance between the discovery of a true analysis of society and the will to act on it. This expression of doubt regarding the efficacy of persuasion ought to give us pause, coming as it does from an interpreter who would soon assist in composing one of the most demonstrably influential of political writings. So there he's referring to, I assume, the Communist Manifesto. He wrote other things too, so Marx wrote a lot of influential stuff. Das Kapital, he wrote many things. Marx knew that every calculation of rhetoric assumes that persuasion can sometimes occur, but the assumption itself is surprisingly hard to prove. No doubt, people may come to think in ways they never thought before, but the cause may be a religious conversion, an intense friendship, a spell of sickness or anxiety. You ever get so sick that you come out of it changed? Maybe you haven't. <clears throat> I think we've experienced this kind of sickness, or 
you know, we used to experience it less today. Right now we're experiencing it a lot, but the way that people are coming out changed by COVID uh, is part of the nature of the disease, maybe different than other diseases. There are some diseases that historically people come out of, like, Tuberculosis, if you convalesce from tuberculosis, many people experience, you know, just kind of euphoria and extreme gratitude for life. They, they maybe sometimes wanted to change their life to become better people. Well, that is that persuasion? Did tuberculosis persuade you to become a better person? Maybe not. That would be weird to say. In short, many things besides a change of mind accomplished by words. All we can say about the transition is that something has changed in someone's beliefs. Just as the attempt at persuasion may fail to persuade or may drag the reader in a direction unanticipated by the writer, so a literary production that aims at nothing but thought and feeling may find itself doing something, having an effect on the reader quite other than it imagined. So you, even if you say to yourself, oh, well, you know, if you have the idea, oh, no, words don't do anything, you might be doing something even when you say that. You, you might not be able to turn it on or off like, oh, no, I'm not acting. Well, maybe you are. <clears throat> this can be embarrassing to admit in view of the more exalted claims that have been made for literature. All values ultimately come from our judicial sentences, wrote Ezra Pound in a letter of 1922. And Jeffrey Hill in his essay, Our Word is Our Bond, offered a necessary corrective. In a poet's involvement with poetry, there is an element of helplessness, of being at the mercy of accidents, the prey of one's own presumptuous energy. Hill ended by a approving a modified version of Pound's dictum. Dictum is like a saying, or it's even more than a saying. It's somebody's in particular's saying. All values ultimately go into our judicial sentences. But what do they do once they're in there? And where do they go afterwards? Similar questions are prompted by Seamus Haney's essay, The Government of the Tongue. <laughs> and, you know, Seamus Haney is an Irish poet, so the government of, that might sound like, especially if you're an American like me at first, like the government of the tongue, who's who's in charge of the tongue? The brain? You know, you might, you might think about it like that. If you're like, you're imagining a little capital building on the tongue. But the government of the tongue, like, is more, can also be heard like, oh, govern yourself, you know, govern your behavior. Maybe it sounds older to us, different dialects. Some terms are feel older or not as old, depending on what dialect of a language you're in. But here I think that's what it is he's talking about. But you can go read Seamus Haney's essay if you want. The title itself is a pun that marks the author's ambivalence regarding the boundary between ideal and worldly authority. So it's both of those meanings. Haney wanted to preserve a distinction between the imaginative and persuasive uses of words, and yet he knew that such a distinction is difficult to sustain. The essay suggests a solution may come from the idea that poetry vindicates itself through the exercise of its own expressive powers. But isn't that kind of like saying, mm, I don't need to justify me being here because I'm so hot. It's just like, is that really vindicating itself? I don't know. Aesthetic rightness and rhetorical efficacy would thus be seen to coincide. But then, most strangely, Haney chooses an epitome of the self-vindication of poetry, the, passable of the, the passage of the Gospel of John about the woman taken in adultery. So he's going to give us the passage. So if you don't know it, don't worry. He's going to sum it up which is what many authors will do when they really want to emphasize that their example is important. They'll like name it like you should already know it, but then also tell it to you because it's really important. You should, we should do it again. But it's also a kind of way of being like, oh yeah, if you don't know it, don't worry. So it kind of performs both things at once. The passage begins with the scribes and the Pharisees citing the commandment which requires the woman be stoned. They say this to tempt Jesus that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And there's this weird thing about this moment in the Gospel of John. And it's written in, in Greek. And people are like trying to figure out, like, well, what did he write? It doesn't really tell you. They're just like, he started writing. Which is a weird way to tell a story. You're like, so then a character s sat down and started writing something on the ground. And you're like, oh, okay, what? Like we just did it before. Like you, he's like, that story. And then he tells us the story. But in this story, we don't know what he's writing. They never tell us. An attitude of unconcern and apparent detachment may have been useful for his survival. And it also goes with the lesson he men means to impart. Judge not, lest ye be judged. They prod him until he replies, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Let him first cast a stone at her. At which the elusive stage direction is repeated. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. It's like, what is he writing? The men feel themselves to be convicted by their own conscience, and they leave the scene. One by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Jesus now raises himself, and seeing that he is alone with the woman, he asks, Hath no man condemned thee? 
She replies that none has. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So this is a famous story from the Christian Bible. It's a weird. It's a weirder story than people realize because most people get the kind of moral side of it, which is, oh, you know, we're all sinners. We all kind of do bad things. So um, stop judging other people. We kind of, you know, that's part of it. That's part of it. But it's a little weirder than that. One of the things that's weird about it is this writing bit. He's going to talk about it. Um, there's an also a joke that Catholics like to tell based on this story, which I think is kind of funny. They're like, they tell the beginning of the story. So Jesus came and they said, this woman must be stoned to death. And Jesus says, you who is without sin, throw the first stone. And then he gets hit in the back of the head. He goes, Ow, hey, mom, because Catholics think that. Okay, his mom <laughs> didn't have sin. So she throws the stone at him. It's kind of a joke. Okay, but anyway, the scribes and the Pharisees evidently planned to accuse Jesus after hearing him utter a new law contrary to their own. He outwits them by saying nothing new, directing them instead to the universality of their law. It applies to each of them as much as to the woman. Haney takes the passage to demonstrate the non-literal yet vast and unassailable powers that reside in poetry. But how does the activity of Jesus resemble the activity of a poet? The drawing of those characters is like poetry, writes Haney, a break with the usual life, but not an absconding from it. So Seamus Haney is saying this like weird moment that doesn't fit into the story is like kind of a way of being in that religious, judicial, political moment of like, this woman is accused, what should we do? And they're trying to trip him up. The Pharisees are kind of trying to trip Jesus up in this point in the story to get him to make a wrong move. So there are all sorts of interpretations about it. This is one interpretation. The drawing of those characters is like poetry, a break with the usual life, but not an absconding from it. It's a weird kind of middle, middle space that opens up. This seems a perverse emphasis. The writing by Jesus on the ground surely is an absconding if we consider it in isolation, whereas what happens afterward brings him into the common life. He saves the woman from being stoned to death by dispersing the crowd of her accusers. He does it by the force of his spoken challenge. But it is the undeciphered characters written with his finger that interest Haney and everybody else. Come on. Poetry holds attention for a space, as Jesus does when he writes on the ground. Functions not as a distraction, but as pure concentration. A focus where our power to concentrate is concentrated back on ourselves. And it's funny that he uses that term here because there's a poem by Seamus Haney that I happen to know and really like. And it contains the line, I don't know if I got it exactly, but um, the demand or the desire to contemplate a single point and the demand to participate actively in history. So he talks about being caught between those this desire to contemplate a single point and then to actively participate in history. And here in this story, or in his interpretation of this story, he kind of shows the relationship between those. So it's not that he's kind of being pulled in two directions. It's actually caught between those two is where this kind of action is. This moment of not absconding, but of, what does he say? Breaking, breaking but not absconding. This peculiar reading obeys an anomalous motive of 20th century defenses of literature. Words are at once praised for their ethical value and acquitted of the charge that they do something. Right? So, like, it's so good. Yeah, you know, I mean, he's, I don't think he's just going to be hard on Haney here. I think he's going to you know, try to tease out something. I don't know what he's going to do. I haven't read it. I think he's going to try to tease out another meaning for it. But one, I do kind of, we do have a version of this that I would kind of ridicule which is, oh gosh, we aren't talking enough about, people always say this, we aren't talking enough about X, or we aren't talking enough about Y. We don't, as if to talk about it would be the the thing that we need to do. And I find that to be like, it's it's kind of, it can be kind of annoying, but it's also curious. It's a, It suggests something more than what people might intend by it. We, we're never, we don't talk enough about this. Wonder what wonder what people might might mean by that. <clears throat> to repeat, the gospel passage owes little of its force to the writing on the ground that Haney associates with poetry. It is concerned with the world of action, the practical meaning of the law that Jesus publicly interprets in order to save the woman's life. Blake said that forgiveness of sins is the only teaching by which Christianity offers a moral principle, distinct from the pagan philosophies. There is not one moral virtue that Jesus inculcated, but Plato and Cicero did inculcate before him. What then did Christ inculcate? Forgiveness of sins. 
This alone is the gospel, and this is the life and immortality brought to light by Jesus. So it sounds very Christian here, but I think, again, this is maybe a little bit of a symptom of David Bromwich being like a Yale literature guy. Where he's just like, no, no, we can talk quite casually about Christianity. It's not casual, I should say, but like, he, he kind of maybe would upset both the people who are like, why are you referring to Christianity and not to other religions? And also to people who would be like, this is my faith. Why are you treating it just like another piece of literature? <clears throat> and probably he, would, he wouldn't care <laughs> that he would offend both of those groups. He'd just be like, because one of the reasons I know him is he wrote this piece about why we should uh, pay less attention to offending people with our speech. He has a more sophisticated version of that argument than we usually hear, though. So, uh, I have singled out Haney and Hill because they were gifted writers who aimed to think clearly about the effects of words. The same perplexities occur when commentators of lesser stature address the subject. We are apt to treat with mockery or with casual dismissal the idea that poets are unacknowledged legislators. I think it was Shelley, the poet Shelley, that said that unacknowledged legislators of the world are poets. But if we try to do justice to the influence of literature on life, we are fated to repeat the claim in however disguised a form. And it looks as if Shelley was right after all. We cannot estimate what we owe to the unacknowledged and unacknowledgeable legislators who affect us through language. A similar understanding applies to the everyday speakers of remembered words. Somebody is hearing them and getting a sensation that may hardly be discerned. Language affects human action. It is involved in almost everything we do, and its meanings are imperfectly determined, both ameliorated and degraded, made better and made worse by those who write and those who read. Forgive them, for they know what, know what they do. In the present context may seem an excessive plea, but it is true enough that only partially and in the web of corrigible errors can we pretend to know what we are doing with words. So he's doing it, you know, this is quite clever. It's a very good, good job there, David. But, um... Beyond being clever, I think there is a really important idea in here. And it's one that I also uh, try to get to with Toni Morrison's Nobel Prize literature speech. Nobel Prize for literature speech. Which I just realized that in my syllabus was autocorrected to just Nobel Prize. Uh, which is fine. Which is fine. Um, I'm not going to go change it. <laughs> uh, uploading a second document, that's too much work. But spending like four hours reading a chapter on stream is not enough. So that's part of who I am. Anyway, so um, language affects human action is, I mean, I think not a bad axiom, but it does kind of need to be proved. Does It does need to be proved to most people. Most people are going to be like, hmm, a little suspicious. Like, how much? Aren't there other things? What about money? What about biology? What about sex and food and all sorts of other things? And they see those as separate from language. So part of it is kind of showing how language is cannot really be in some serious way separated from all of those other things. That what we're talking about when we're talking about language is not just the moments when people are speaking, but how all of our thinking and our habits and our ways of being in the world are formed by being beings that speak, being beings that are in language. That the weirdness of us as compared to all other animals doesn't make us better. I don't, I don't think it necessarily makes us worse either. We would only be the only ones that we could judge anyway. Is that we are speaking animals. Not necessarily the smartest animals, but the speaking ones. So, um, but, so we're going to talk a little bit about that in the book. But he's also doing something, the clever bit here is to say before he was like, look, there are these two things... Po poetry or language in general is said to be great. Hey, what's up, Steve? Welcome to the stream. We're reading um, this book, and I'm trying to figure out whether I want to uh, want to use this, but I like this idea that he's putting forward in this introduction, so I'm feeling better about it already. So he's just ending here. I should like to thank blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, actually, I'll re we'll read this part. He says something here. I should like to thank the Oxford Faculty of English for the invitation to deliver the Clarendon Lectures. The lectures are now called chapters, but I have not concealed indications that the book originated in talks to a diverse audience of scholars whom I hope to convince by illustrative quotations of some like. Then I talked at the top of the stream of how I feel about collected lectures and how I tend to really like them 
usually a little bit better than some of the other kinds of stuff that might be written by the same people who are speaking. The result is an extended essay, not a treatise, and I have kept the notes to a minimum by largely confining the references to quotations of two sentences or more. <laughs> That's really, uh, really specific. I have formalized by a loose punctual... Wait, I'm sorry. I have formalized the loose epistolary spelling in a letter by Blake. Epistolary spelling, what does that mean? An epistle is someone who's writing a letter. So sometimes, especially with Blake, who lived in the 18th century, the, the spelling might be a little different from what you're used to. We, If you take English as a subject, you learn spelling or orthography, and it's this like really rigid thing. That's all very new. They kind of all just made that up. You know, so um, it's important to learn, but it's basically just kind of artificially important. It's important because people think it's important. It's the only reason it's important. That might be true of everything. A final chapter written later is included here to underscore a warning about sen against censorship, which the preceding chapters may be felt to imply. Recent attempts to control the spread of dangerous language. Yeah, ye old spilling. Yeah, exactly. Um, recent attempt to control. It's not that. It's Blake's not that old, obviously, so it shouldn't be that hard to read. Uh, control the spread of dangerous language should be understood in the same light as all the other religious or moral codes that historically have sought to shelter human conduct from pollution by forces we cannot see, hear, smell, touch, or taste. No, but I'm pretty old just practicing. <laughs> <clears throat> you, you're old enough to probably have learned cursive in school. That's pretty old. I'm grateful to Seamus Perry. Okay, so these are really just thank yous. Um, it might be very interesting for the the true <laughs> Bromwich heads here in the stream, but I'm going to skip it and go to this first chapter. Does persuasion occur? Let's find out. <clears throat> I do remember that was very tough. Yeah, we did a lot of that, which might not be surprising. Um, and then we have two uh, epigrams here at the top. The rhetorician would deceive his neighbors, the sentimentalist himself. Yates from Ego. Dominus to us. Um, huh. The rhetorician would deceive his neighbors, the sentimentalist himself. You know, I need a little bit more context than that, but I don't know that one by Yeats. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Shakespeare, King Lear. Okay. Great. Does persuasion occur? What do you think? Let's take some bets at the top here. Um, you're going to go with the 6 1 odds on uh, Lucky Poke. Are you going to go with Austin? All right, what if these are the three names of horses in a, at a race trick? Austin, Aristotle, and Cicero. Which horse would you bet on? Does persuasion occur? Well, I don't know that we're going to know the answer at the end of reading this chapter, but maybe we'll have a better version of the question. And that's really mostly what I hope from these readings. This is why I'm interested in, in giving readings and public speaking is that we get better versions of the question that we're always asking, always returning to, um, well, I'm always ret returning to it because I'm teaching the same class, but we're, we're always returning to it as people, I think, even when we're not conscious of the question. Like The question is kind of embedded in the acts of communication. So this is making it clearer, making it explicit, giving it some room for reflection. <clears throat> I borrow the title of this series of lectures from two well-known phrases, W.H. Auden and his Elegy for William Butler Yeats, deplored the emotional extravagance and moral recklessness of the poet whose death he mourned, but he ended by granting a partial exoneration. Whatever Yeats's motives may have been, Auden declared, he could not be accused of fomenting wickedness since, after all, poetry makes nothing happen. <laughs> That's a nice way to, like, insult, insult your enemy of being like, you know, I can't say that anything that they did even though they were a vicious, cruel bastard. Nothing that they did was really vicious or cruel because they failed at everything they tried. It's like you get, it's a double whammy, but then the uppercut comes in. <clears throat> the maxim was assimilated to critical doctrine in the 1950s and became part of the common sense of literary studies. The defense of poetry, it implies, was still going strong a generation later. When one of my teachers, W.K. Wimsatt, memorably defined a poem as a verbal object whose only end is to be known. God, that is just like what a what a dead fish way of like beginning <laughs> to think about a poem. It's a verbal object whose only end is to be known. Like, oh my God, that makes you wonder about how those people are in the rest of their life when people say things like that. You know, kind of um, chalk. It's like they eat chalk for breakfast or something when they say things like that. I do, this is also making reminding me that Adrienne Rich the. 
um, feminist poet talks about like the she fell in love with poetry by reading Yeats, which I thought was kind of interesting. And she was just like, she I I can't say exactly how she expressed it, but it was something along the lines of, but like it was too like Yeats made me almost too in love with language, and I had to learn, as we're gonna kind of argue about in this piece, learn how to like make words do things or something like that. She had she had a better version of that. A great poem shouldn't make you want to join a movement or change your life. Its nature is not to persuade. And even if it has that effect on some people, that is not why it matters, nor is what we come to value it for. So if a, if a poem changes your life, I've I've been wanting to write this essay, This Song Did Not Save Your Life, because you hear that in the comment section of so many YouTube music videos. Or just like if you're on a music scene, you'll hear people say this about like the worst band you've ever met in your life. And people mean this completely sincerely, and I don't doubt that music has played a, a role in many people's lives that um, felt like salvation. But I think we sometimes, we come out of that with this hyper-attachment to what those qualities are in that in that experience, trying to make them the qualities of a thing that we can return to over and over again. And that might be where people get a little bit, you can get a little bit stuck in that, in that sense of things. The other half of my title comes from J.L. Austin's book, How to Do Things with Words. The, though instruction on doing things with words may cut against the idea that words make nothing happen, Austin's sense of the way certain words perform specific actions was quite compatible with Auden's dictum that words of another sort reliably act so as to bring about no effect. Austin was not talking about poetry. Rather, his survey con- covered a limited set of verbal formulae, that accomplish something concrete in the course of their saying or by virtue of certain words having been said. So if you've never heard of speech act theory, that's not a problem. And uh, I'm sorry that I'm I'm, I'm making you think about this, especially at this hour of the night. But um, speech act theory was like real extreme. It actually remains very popular in certain corners. But it's what became an extremely influential theory of a philosophical theory. And theory really here in a sense of kind of hypothetical but general description of how language works. There are these different things that you can do. And he's going to tell you what it sounds like. He mainly drew his examples from small and large ceremonial occasions, saying welcome to people in order to welcome them. So when I say welcome, I'm not referring to something. I'm just greeting you. And so philosophers before had been, and they still are, god damn, they're really focused on the meaning of language being through reference. A rabbit somehow points to this little fuzzy thing in the world, right? How does that happen? And they become really mystified. So Austin at least was trying to give people a little bit more elbow room to be like, well, look at all of these things that happen without what seems like reference. Greeting someone doesn't, you're not really referring to anything, you know? <clears throat> um, so it's helpful. Saying them saying thank you, where the saying gives the thanks. So far, the point is so clear it may hardly need explaining. But we can easily call to mind interactions that have a more formal character. A policeman says to a culprit, "I arrest you." <laughs> is that is is that what he is that what he said? Is that what he said? And in doing so, arrests him. A priest affirms to a couple, "I now pronounce you man and wife," and they are married. It's funny because I have married people. And it has a nice ambiguity in in English, but no, 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 <clears throat> no rings. But I have married people more on many occasions, and in fact, I did it for one couple twice. So legally, they were already married, but I did this thing. <laughs> they wanted to do the ceremony again too, and so it was one of these weird moments where like that classic example became weird for me because I was like, it's actually. This actually shows like one of the, these weird exceptions. Like if I were a philosopher, I should write the paper on this, but it's just not that. It's boring because it's obviously more complicated than that. But I'm saying the same formulas. For some people in the audience, it might feel, you know, depending on how they look at it, if they don't know that it's the second time or they weren't invited to the first one. I don't know. You know it might feel like the real thing, but what makes it real is something different than my words. What made the first one real was that it was authorized with a license and it was then, you know, that license was taken to the city hall and legal documents were changed. So anyway, um, this wasn't a very sophisticated theory, even though it keeps hanging around. It isn't hard to pick out the family resemblance among situations in which words either perform an action or constitute a necessary part of a performance in which their actual force is proved by the appropriate accompanying measures or gestures. 
At first glance, the only poems that would seem to do this are poems in the shape of a preordained blessing or curse, a petition or prayer, such as Milton's sonnet on the last massacre in Piedmont. And I'm going to have to read you a part of a sonnet. Here we go. I'm not ready for this. <clears throat> Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the Alpine mountains cold. Even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worship stocks and stones, forget not. Milton's call for divine retribution against the killers of Waldensian heretics is inseparable from the prayer-like command, avenge, right? And so Milton was a Puritan against the kind of Anglicans in the uh, English Civil War and the, actually also against the Presbyterians. So we don't need to go into everything of this English Civil War, but let's say he was a super religious guy in a very weird way. He had weird ideas about... in Like in Paradise Lost, the angels like eat food and that's how they become holier. And they like... It makes you think, I guess the angels have to shit. Like, do they have holier shits and stuff? Every time they shit, they get holier. It, kind of, that he kind of implies that. So, anyway, Milton is a very religious guy, but also very unusual in his religious thinking. And he's calling these people who have been killed, um, that are people that he believes are righteous people, he's saying that they were martyrs, slaughtered saints. And that becomes a motive to avenge them. <clears throat> which is an action, right? Avenge, it's calling to action. But God is not only his listener, or God is not his only listener. Remembrance, so far as it can be performed, turns into a fact through the utterance of the imperative, forget not. So if I tell you to remember something, uh, honey, honey, remember the milk. I'm making you remember the milk as I'm doing that, right? For a less weighty instance, compare Tennyson's affirmation in his lovely verses to E. Fitzgerald, that the poem he is writing will itself be a, his appropriate gift. And so I send a birthday line of greeting. <laughs> Tennyson is like my least favorite poet, maybe. <laughs> He's really not very good. But I did learn a funny thing about him the other day for totally random reason. But he apparently, I think it was, oh God, Ferdinand VI, maybe, who was the monarch of Spain. And he and his friend, like, went on an international escapade to try to overthrow him with this, like, band of revolutionaries. <laughs> but apparently he just did it out of peer pressure. He was just, he got peer pressured into <laughs> into a, a monarchical coup. <laughs> but then, like, I guess escaped with his life and then just went home. <laughs> And wrote a bunch of poems, back, not very good poems. Tennyson is like, so this is the thing that's frustrating about this guy is why are you making all these references? Like, okay, I'm sure the English literary tradition is very important. We should really respect it. Do we need to make it Tennyson though? Fucking A. Just like the deadest uh, things. But anyway, I still, I like his argument. I do like the argument so far. He knows that his old, I'm anticipating the argument, but. I, I like where I think it's going. He knows that his old friend will welcome the special gift in accordance with the pattern of their friendship. <clears throat> when in our younger day, London days, you found some merit in my rhymes, and I more pleasure in your praise. The words both anticipate and prove the continuity of a reciprocal feeling. So he's like saying, look, the words are doing things. It seems kind of obvious. It is kind of obvious. Contemporary theorists of textual interpretation have shown considerable interest in Austin's idea of performative utterance. Now, let me unpack some of the academic uh, what word act speech acts that are happening here. He's 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 um he's reading them to filth, as as you would say today, in this little line. <laughs> Contemporary theorists of textual interpretation have shown considerable interest. When you say that you're one of your colleagues in the academy has shown considerable interest in an idea. You're about to say that this idea is, is like, not, not very interesting, usually. <clears throat> I have in mind particularly the writings of Quentin Skinner and J.G.A. Pocock. These are two intellectual historians who have made quite a great deal of fuss about the speech act theory, which interpret texts in the canon of political thought as speech acts directed to a certain audience at a certain time. Wow. <clears throat> the readers of a persuasive text, it is argued, learn how to read the verbal cues in a special and almost explicit way. Persuasion on this view functions so that the reader completes a performance intended by the writer. And that's not that dumb. That seems like a reasonable way of thinking about the relationship there. My argument takes a similar starting point without trying to establish a set of generic constraints or elusive signals 
<laughs> you're doing a lot of elusive signaling uh, so far, though, buddy, that open a path of communication between writer and reader. I am concerned rather with occasions on which words may persuade in spite of themselves and often in spite of their avowed intention. So <clears throat> this is why I'm like excited about this piece is because he's trying to develop a theory, even though he's going to use all these allusions to literature that are not going to help make this go over well with my students, which, you know, whatever. But he's trying to make a point that I think is very valuable, which is we are in persuasion. We are persuading people not because of our intentions, that, that oftentimes we persuade people against our intentions. And Steve, you know this because it was a conversation we were having about persuasion. How do we teach persuasion? Is persuasion supposed to be the term that we put forward as the main one, even when people imagine persuasion in this really um, artificial way of, I'm going to take my idea and my idea is going to beat yours. And that's how persuasion works. Or persuasion is some kind of replace Tennyson with Kendrick Lamar. I do. I do in class all the time. They get kind of annoyed with all my Kendrick Lamar references. He's one of the he's one of the ones I go to a lot. <clears throat> um, yeah, we could do that, actually. That'd be fun. I got loyalty like royalty inside my DNA is a better version of... Anyway, it, it, it's too complicated for this stuff. So maybe it's good to use Tennyson because it's so basic. The language is so basic that, you know, you don't have to deal with all the complexity that you'd actually find in a Kendrick Lamar song. So, um... Where was I? I'm concerned rather. Yeah, okay, there. One of them is making a stream contemplate about Lamar right now. I don't know. I think it's probably like, I think Kendrick Lamar is a little bit millennial, to be honest. I hate to admit it, but yeah, yeah. I think he's like a little bit for the older kids now. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. It's not that like he, people, he's just not as, he's not as popular as I thought, I thought he might be, but we'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> It's hard to say, though. I had, like, a huge Taylor Swift contingent in one class. And then I was like, oh, Taylor Swift, and, like, playing some of the music. And so I was like, turn that off. Like, it was the classes, like, split 50-50. Love, hate. So you can never know. <clears throat> yeah. Um, he's still around. He's still around. But he's just he hasn't put out a lot of new stuff either. So, you know, it's uh, use it or lose it there, Kendrick. Anyone who has ever been asked to prove that persuasion occurs will realize how hard it is to take the first steps in such a proof. I found this out in my first years of teaching when a colleague in the philosophy department denied that people's minds were ever changed by the other things other people said. This is, I love this, this also, <laughs> because I've had this conversation with many of my colleagues in the philosophy department. So like, no, that just, is, that just isn't how it works. It's not how it happens. Well, okay, well, how does it happen? They don't know, but they know it's not the way I'm saying it is. <laughs> I thought the opposite, you know, which is, that's good. That's good. I thought the opposite was true and cited the example of Martin Luther King. Now, I've also started to think differently about students will always be like, oh, wow, there's so much philosophy in this class. And I used to be kind of like, you know, it's not really, but I'm like, you know what, I'm going to take that because <laughs> that's, that would piss off the philosophers more if they thought that what we were doing is philosophy. <clears throat> that's a good point. Time's actually, this will never end. I don't know what this mean is referring to. What's the anaphora of your of your this? Because <clears throat> time is slippery for me when I'm not looking at the chat closely. So I don't know when you said that. Um, okay. On theoretical grounds alone, he simply did not believe that minds could be changed by words. Right? My response that people were, or there were people who testified to the impact of King's speeches, failed to settle that dispute. <clears throat> right. Exactly. I recall this deadlock partly as warning about the readings that support my argument. No words can suffice as proof of the consequences of words. So this is kind of like when rhetoric, when rhetoricians like to get melodramatic about their position, they're like, no, no one, no one believes in the power of words because the only way we can say it is with words. You know, it can be a little bit melodramatic. This equals philosophy profs claiming people are not influenced by words, right? Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, you know, our back to our old blood feuds. I love it. It would be. It wouldn't be fun, you know. We couldn't be like the two um, Zani in the Commedia if we didn't have each other to play off of. <clears throat> the thing is, they could always forget that we're there. <laughs> I guess that's the that's that's our, our our most famous bit is that there are two clowns on stage. The one clown doesn't know that the other one is there. That's the relationship of philosophy and rhetoric. I get students saying, "Professor, do you teach the required philosophy classes?" And then they get sad when I tell them no. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Right. Be like, no, these, these are the, yeah, we can't totally own that because the university does, does cut the, 
they cut the lard up a little different. <clears throat> but I am interested in the half metaphorical, half literal usages that mark a boundary between rhetoric and poetry, or between the persuasive and imaginative uses of words, a boundary we generally acknowledge to exist while recognizing that it is exceedingly difficult to locate. I will ask what it is about an attempt an, an attempted sorry. I will ask what it is about an attempted act of persuasion. Something about that syntax is not clicking for me. Oh, that is coming. Okay. I probably do this too, which is annoying. Like, too, there's too much, it's too involuted in the sentence. And in the minds of some readers, a demonstrably successful act that makes it hard for, for us, so hard for us to say for sure whether the words are fanciful or accurate, fictional or matter of fact, <clears throat> plainly false or manifestly true. Persu persuasive words may be both things, and of course, they may be at once faithful and fanciful and true, but they don't show their colors with a satisfying clarity one way or the other. Allowing for this necessary qualification, I proceed on the assumption that persuasion does occur and that we can know it by introspection, even if we heed no other testimony. We can know it by introspection is not a line that persuades me. I don't like that, but that's because I'm very biased against the term introspection for very weird reasons. So I'm going to let that one pass and not, not talk too much about it. At the same time, the results of a given attempt at persuasion are uncontrollable. It is easier to say that certain words will affect people than it is to say how the words will affect them. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then here we go <laughs> into the Edmund Burke stuff and William Hazlitt. Why? God, why? It pisses me off that he's doing this. Like, why put this argument with this stuff? But it just, he's a Yale professor. He doesn't know. How else would you do it? It's the only way you could do it. And, you know, it's 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 good to feel this way because I, I know I do feel the same the same kind of thing happens after a while when you okay consider an extreme example of persuasion that was probably unintended near the end of a letter to a noble lord edmund burke imagines with sensational vividness the demolition of the landed estates of his enemy and detractor the duke of bedford burke supposes the agents of destruction to be the french jacobin who will have invaded and conquered england an action that radical politics of the young duke might be taken to have encouraged so edmund burke is the famous yeah, it's an Oxford audience, of course. Right, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Why can't he write for my my intended audience, not his? Um, Edmund Burke is a famous, the famous father of conservatism, which many people claim, or many people are called, but, um, you know, he's in there. And one of his you know, main big things, was the French Revolution was a mistake was not a fan of the French Revolution, and spe specifically the terror. He was not a fan of the terror. Um, the passage begins, His grace's landed possessions are irresistibly inviting to an agrarian experiment. And you can hear experiment. You have to read that with a certain amount of disdain to understand Edmund Beck. And the phantasmagoria that unrolls must have seemed to Burke's followers a brilliant vindication of his counter-revolutionary argument, a deserved satire on the dangerous pretensions of men of privilege who commit waste on their on the inheritance. <clears throat> Yet we know that the same passage was capable of having a different effect. To romantic radicals of the next generation, such as the young William Hazlitt, it exemplified the ascendancy of individual genus over inherited power and privilege. Burke was uttering fearless truths against the unmerited distinction of aristocracy. So Burke thinks he's making a conservative argument. This is just to put it in terms that maybe be a little bit closer to our time. <clears throat> Burke thinks he's making a conservative argument because he's talking about this aristocrat, but it's this is aristocrat's revolutionary fantasies. So he's, he's ridiculing and mocking and has disdain for. But Hazlitt's reading it later and is like, yeah, exactly, tell off those tell off those um, landed people, those fat cats. And he hears it more as like an argument that might we might say comes from the left. Well, And also the left is pretty new because the left is this thing that comes out of the French Revolution, right? Where did they sit? <clears throat> On the left. Okay. Um, anyway, that's the story I've heard. Maybe there's more to it than that. A letter to a noble lord is a satirical polemic with an overtly political subject. It would now be classified in the crudest terms as nonfiction. But that helps very little in gauging the consequences of Burke's imaginings. Even a proper generic frame cannot prevent a response that goes aslant of anything the author intended. Words act in divergent ways on intelligent readers. So this is just an, again, this is a really important point. Don't, 
<clears throat> this I, w- I wouldn't it's hard to find great examples of this but it's not necessarily that one thing we should emphasize is not that Hazlitt misreads <clears throat> Burke it's not that Hazlitt gets Burke wrong Hazlitt understands the point that Burke is making he even understands probably the point that Burke thinks he's making it's persuasive to Hazlitt for different reasons and that's what uh, Bromwich is trying to get across which is that the persuasiveness of that of that language of those words, um, the persuasive of, of Burke's own arguments might not be persuasive to the ends that he imagines. They might be, they might not be. They might be and not be. Consider now a quite different example from the art of fiction. Henry James, in his novels and stories, drew many portraits of the collector, the man, it is usually a man, who exhibits a wonderful curatorial concern with his impressions, with his acquisition of rare or delicate objects. There is likely to be some initial agreement on which characters we judge to be specimens of the type. Gilbert Osmond, in The Portrait of a Lady, is one. Another is the nameless publishing scoundrel of the Asprey Papers. Don't know that one. But subsequent disagreement may cover a wide range. How do we judge the moral character of Adam Verver in The Golden Ball? Oh, tell me. How do we? The answer will depend in large measure on what we make of his relationship to his daughter Maggie, a relationship that borders on the incestuous. When the two of them manipulate their respective partners in order to restore the integrity of Maggie's marriage, <clears throat> their secret intimacy outweighs the love they feel for their mates. This will appear to some taste perverse, to others a transubstantiation of love to a higher register. Our judgment necessarily brings into play many things about us, apart from what are from quite apart from on our grasp of I think there's too many prepositions in there. Or is that just me? What James wanted us to think, even if we could be sure that he was aiming at in the golden ball. In a case like this, the dispute about meaning turns us back to irreducible intuitions about how to live and what to do, the actions we admire and the things we care for most. <clears throat> and this is really interesting for other reasons, which also relate to Steve. And we were talking about values and we we're reading a book together called The New Rhetoric, which is not that new anymore, but it was once. One of those weird things about words, too, is that they can change their meaning in time just because of time. <clears throat> um, but here, values being like an interpretive principle is kind of been part of what I've been thinking about and how I would develop the ideas that they're putting forth in their piece about abstract values versus concrete values. <clears throat> anyway, let's keep going. And the causes we are willing to fight for. Thoreau's great essay, Civil Disobedience, was credited by Gandhi with having exerted a major influence on his thought. Among the few other writings he placed in the same category was Ruskin's Unto This Last. Now, all that is news to me, and I don't know this piece, so... If anybody, if anybody here, if either of you, because it looks like there's a couple in here, um, know what this is. Is this coming up on my, no, yeah. Unto this last, yeah. I'll have to check this out later, but it's kind of surprising. I know that John Ruskin is like an art critic. So <laughs> how did that become a, a very influential text to Gandhi would be interesting to think about, but Ruskin could have written about other things. Gandhi could have been interested in art and applied those principles to, you know, could be either way, um, which just maybe makes the argument even stronger. Thoreau, who said the hanging of John Brown, the anti-slavery terrorist, would make the gallows as glorious as the cross, and Ruskin, the feudal critic of high capitalism, would have been equally surprised at their offspring a doctrine and practice of nonviolent resistance that ended British rule in India. I mean, that, for, if you put it that way, that makes it kind of clear. It's like, who would have thought that these, these guys couldn't have thought that their ideas would be, not just because it's in India, but that like, <clears throat> it would take that form, that it would look that way. It would look like nonviolent resistance. Because that might, there might be, obviously there's elements of that in their writing, but that got pulled out and developed by Gandhi is very powerful. I've been reminded recently of this famous metaphor that appears in lots of writing. It's probably most famously associated with Francis Bacon, even though it appears in many different older texts, even ancient texts, about the three insects. You have the ant, you have the spider, and you have the bee. And you want to be like the bee, not the ant or the spider. And that might not be obvious at first, but here's why. It's all about how they use what they do with other things. 
So the ant gets material, it picks it up, it goes out and gets material, and it just kind of brings it back. It goes out and gets it, and it brings it back. It stores it up, stuff to eat. That's pretty much it. It doesn't really change the stuff. It doesn't significantly change the things that it finds. It just finds them, brings them back. The spider doesn't need to do that. The spider creates some out of its own substance. It's a web. It creates out of its own substance. So these are two forms of reasoning uh, or two forms of making arguments or two forms of thinking. One which is just like, here's the evidence, plop. Here's the idea, plop. And then there's the spider that's like, well, if we suppose X, ergo Y, who's just doing it, it's all in their head. The bee is a little different. The bee alights on a flower, gets some nectar, brings it back to the hive, kind of like the ant, it would seem, but then it transforms it with its own substance, it transforms the things that it founds outside into honey. And we could say that this is maybe a way to think about this process, that Gandhi is like a bee. <clears throat> and he flies like a butterfly and he stings like a bee. Um, don't sting. <laughs> don't use your sting. Um, maybe that is another way he's like a bee, because if you use your sting, you will die. Nonviolence. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> no stinging, right. But he developed these ideas he found from other places through his own, he wouldn't say his own substance, but through, through his own kind of practice. He metabolized these ideas into something distinct, but transformed, but also clearly from something. When you have honey from a certain place, you can kind of taste the flower in it. Like, oh, that's wildflower flower honey. Oh, that's Japanese knotweed honey. That came from the back. We can tell where those bees have been. The uncontrollability of persuasion, however, doesn't come under the heading of ambiguity, though the two are related. They indicate separate kinds of uncertainty. And ambiguity, even if unconscious on the part of the author, must have been allowed for by the author. And he doesn't mean that the author thought of it and said, I approve, yes. He means that the, the writing, the, the ambiguity is made possible just in the way that it's being communicated. It picks up plausibility from the words themselves and from something about the nature of the work. The relevant context being taken into account, we decide that the words invite an ambiguous reading. By contrast, the unanticipated consequences, or vagrant byproducts, of persuasion may interest us most intensely when they counteract the author's evident wish. And I've been thinking about that idea <clears throat> recently a lot. In French, if you want to, like the way you might translate to mean something is vouloir dire, to want to say, to want to say. So I've been thinking about meaning, not re just recently, but for a long time, as wanting to say, which is kind of recursive. Be like, what did you say? Oh, well, what I wanted to say was, and you say something else. Well, what did you want to say? Well, what, well here's what I wanted to say when I wanted what I wanted to say. And it is kind of recursive in that way. That doesn't mean it's not meaningful. That's actually the source of its meaning. And it's related to that fact that we would find more interesting those moments when someone when someone means something that's against the, their intention. It's not just that we it means something on the basis of something they didn't obviously intend. So someone might have a husky voice, and you might be able to tell they're a smoker. <clears throat> that's fine. Good for you, Sherlock. You figured something out. That's not necessarily what it means when they speak, though. It could be related to it, right? If they're giving you if they're giving you a no smoking campaign then maybe it does. You're like, okay, that person's legit. They know what they're talking about. That sucks. But um, it also could be something where someone says something in a way where you're like, oh, they couldn't hear this meaning that I can hear. They couldn't hear when they said it that way that other people, including me, might hear it this way. And the fact that they didn't hear it is what's really telling about what they say. <clears throat> There's many examples of this. Life is full of examples of this. The one I keep bringing to mind is when Mark Zuckerberg introduced his, I don't know, the, the thing that came before Meta that everyone forgot about because it was so disastrously announced. I mean, Meta was pretty bad too, in my humble opinion. But here I am, not a cartoon, sitting and talking to you and reading a text. So what do I know? Um, but he, there was some other kind of virtual reality thing he tried to introduce earlier. And I made a video about it once too. Um, and they appear as cartoons, and he's like, well, and, it, and Hurricane Maria had just happened. He's like, well, let's zoom down to Puerto Rico. And so there's like a live 360 shot of just devastation from Hurricane Maria. And he and his cartoon buddy are like high-fiving. <laughs> right? So just like totally missing, like totally missing how that would come off. That's what becomes interesting 
in the message, not the whatever bullshit he was saying about the VR. <clears throat> so, um, persuasion isn't necessary. That's not a good example of persuasion. That's an example of very much the opposite of persuasion. Persuasion is a necessary word, no doubt, but dull and rather ungainly as it is commonly used. I have to agree. We bring it in sharper focus if we think of tracking a possible conversion of the reader to a definite belief. But this is not exactly a case of belief in, as we would say of a subscriber to a settled doctrine. Nor is it a case of belief that, as we would say of a proposition about the world that can be put into an indicative sentence. There's a subtler understanding about belief that I think powerful writers and speakers share, whether they know it or not. Well, we can't stop you there. we got to keep going. Man is a believing animal. It is human to want to believe things, and the hunger for belief drives much of human conduct. This fact alone explains much of the content of religion and politics, and a good deal of interest in works of the imagination that we would recognize as bringing them, bringing with them no practical directive. Directive is like, this is what you should do. <clears throat> literature engagé. There was this argument in French literature in the 20th century about like, should literature itself be engaged in the struggle? You know, in the capital T S struggle would be T S, but uh, in the struggle, no, not necessarily. But it doesn't mean it's not doing something. I would distinguish the hunger for belief from what William James called the will to believe, by which he meant the desire for a solid faith in which to ground our most consequential actions. James was pointing to a source of the conviction that we possess of the that we possess freedom of the will, a source that would allow us to anchor that feeling in something greater than ourselves. I'm describing something much less available to conscious and awareness, an eager readiness for contact with apparent realities, but a readiness that doesn't involve credence or putting a proposition into practice. So <clears throat> I don't begin to act in the world by being like, the world is as I see it. It's kind of a weird precondition that philosophers always put before acting. Like before you begin to do anything, you got to come over, overcome all these hurdles about knowing what you're doing. It's like, no, no, I don't. In fact, I never will and never do. And we are doing stuff. Like actions happening despite all of those philosophical hurdles. They're actually not that hard to jump over because they're not really hurdles. <clears throat> um, think of the common expression, you're kidding. When we say it in a certain way, closer to laughter than alarm. We always mean the same thing. I hope it's true, but true or not, how lucky to be hearing of anything so fascinating and improbable. You're kidding. We like it best if the thing is true, but so great is our hunger for belief, we give the speaker credit even if he or she was putting us on. I might use that as like a, that's a nice one sentence. I'm always looking for good sentences that you can vary the meaning of in a bunch of ways by saying it in a different way. <clears throat> that might be a good one to put in the, Toolbox. The joke was on us, and it is almost as good as if it were true. We treat as a manifestation of wit the recounting of a possibly true story, and equally a successful lie which we find gripping. That must be, have been one reason why Aristotle in his rhetoric defined wit as well-bred insolence. <laughs> That's a really good pull. <laughs> that one never, uh, that one never jumped out on the page to me, but now you put it like that. I like that. Well-bred insolence. There is a little bit of that in, in wit, right? Insolence has to... He talks about shamelessness as a feeling. Yeah, what a translation. I have to go back and look at that later, but I'm not going to do that right now, obviously. Like, he talks about shame... Like, shame, obviously, is, a, is... We think about that as a feeling or as a pathos, but shamelessness? That kind of makes you realize when Aristotle talks, talks about shamelessness as... A pathos, like, maybe it's not exactly what we think. Um, like, a pathos is not exactly an emotion. It kind of is, but it's really a lot about its performance. It's not just about its feeling. It's kind of being like, the things that you care about, fuck you, buddy. It's a moment of, like, performing the social meaning of your feeling in that scene. <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of a hard thing to get. But So this is like, when Aristotle's talking about wit as well-bred insolence, it has that... It's in the rhetoric. It has that kind of, like, what publicly is being performed. It's the public meaning of the thing held together. You're always looking at stuff in the rhetoric from the point of view of being an audience member, which is one of the weird things about Aristotle's rhetoric. And I don't know if I've ever put it quite that way before. But but really, that that is one of the things that makes Aristotle's rhetoric so powerful is that he, he puts you in the position of the audience. 
And he's like talking to you like you're go- being going to be the one making the speech. But he's like, the only way you can understand what to do is if you think about it as being it from the point of view of the audience. <clears throat> um, suppose a speaker has embarrassed us, embarrassed us by eliciting our belief in a lie. What of it? The belief itself still interests us and we pardon the trespass. I mean, sometimes you want to be lied to. I have like a hilarious version of this with my nephew recently where Santa, as Trump said, when you're seven, it's kind of marginal, right? <laughs> Literally said that to a kid on the phone with the president of the United States <laughs> about Santa Claus. Do you still believe in that Santa Claus? Um, but he, she uh, informed him after he asked and insisted about whether Santa Claus was real. She was like, well, very gently, and my sister's great with this kind of stuff. Let him know. Tried to make it as gentle, and the spirit of Christmas is real, all that nonsense. <laughs> and then she sent me a screenshot of an email that he sent back to her, which was like, re-Santa. <laughs> all caps. And the body of the email is just, l- angry, 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 angry. <laughs> Super pissed. And then later on, he got in a fight with his brother, and then he found a great opportunity. This is an unrelated fight. Just brothers. And uh, his little brother, who's, you know, very tinier, <clears throat> hit him on the head. And so he's like, Mom, later in the day or the next day, Mom, remember when Charlie uh, hit me on the head? Yeah. Well, we had a conversation before. And this had happened like weeks before. We have a conversation before about like Santa thing. Whatever we talked about, I don't remember. And he's just going to live in a world in which he's going to act like he doesn't remember this conversation because he wants to believe in Santa Claus. <clears throat> Skepticism, which alongside curiosity is the parent of science, is a late development in human nature. Believing, however, is only half the puzzle. In a few persons whose perf- importance is out of proportion to their share of the human group, there is a hunger to be believed. I tell you a story, maybe a true story, maybe because because I want you to hear it approvingly. And the sure sign of your approval will be your belief. I mean, that's a nice kind of simple and obvious formulation, but we don't formulate that a lot. Why do people want to be believed? Because they want it to want to be approved. And like, it's hard to be like, oh yeah, you, that's so great. It's a fucking lie. <laughs> like if you think it's a lie, then you're not really saying good job buddy usually right so the pressing desire to be believed so i will argue in the second lecture is a source of our fascination with dramatic soliloquies that exhibit in detail the process of rationalization or self-justification we can see the same desire at work in the search for explanations that look toward first person action my will what's the thing that moves me and makes me act when we are hard at work persuading ourselves we talk to ourselves silently But this inward dialogue follows none of the protocols of empirical prudence or disinterested morality. It may ignore even the demands of simple self-interest. In such deliberations, we see ourselves as people who want to be believed. Of all the great novelists, Henry James excelled in the portrayal of a consciousness that is at once the subject and the object of a hunger for belief. That's true. And... God, it can be tiresome in those Henry James novels of the person being like, oh, uh, following the treatment in the first, Henry James is great, yeah, no offense, but following the treatment in the first two lectures of persuasion, action, and belief in general, and of speakers who convince themselves, such as Shakespeare's Brutus and Milton's Satan. It's interesting to pick those two as the characters that persuade themselves because they do have some kind of negative connotations. In fact, Brutus ends up in Satan's mouth in Uh, Dante, who comes before both of those guys. But um, the third lecture aims to illustrate a similar process, but now involving a high... I'm sorry, not Brutus. No, that's wrong. Brutus is a... Wait, is Brutus in the mouth? I don't remember. Okay. The third lecture aims to illustrate a similar process, but now involving a high degree of theatrical artifice and premeditation. Here, the speaker appeals to an audience from explicit knowledge of their common situation and the performance inseparably mixes logical, ethical, and emotional lines of address. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> Brutus, Judas, and Cassius. Cassius. Um, here the speaker appeals to an audience. It's a weird... It is kind of a weird crew, but it's like... It makes sense in the weird theology that Dante's operating on, that he's kind of creating. But it also makes more sense when you go to Florence and you see in the, the baptistery... 
which is like um, beautiful building. It has this gold uh, kind of mosaic ceiling. And on the ceiling is like this being with three mouths that has like a men in all three mouths. And I'm like, oh, he obviously was looking at that. Like, you know, I'm sure there's something that's in a footnote somewhere. But I just like looked at it. I was like, oh, that's the thing that he's looking at. You're imagining he was probably in exile at that time. <clears throat> so it's a cool image. You can look up. If you like look up, I don't know, like baptistry, St. and chewing on three guys on Google Images, you'll probably find it. In pursuing this topic, unlike the others, I will stay mostly within the bounds of rhetorical analysis, properly speaking. Even here, the analysis will show there are properly... It's funny to hear somebody talk about rhetorical analysis who's not one of the people who, you know, we imagine would talk about rhetorical analysis. It's not an NCA article. Even here, the analysis will show there are possible inferences from a well-plotted speech that would startle the speaker who saw them beforehand. This is a general truth about words that excite us, and a truth certainly known to the ancients. No tears in the speakers, no tears in the listener. Horace also expected us to know that tears affect us most when they come unbidden. Okay. All right. I mean, no tears in the speaker, no tears in the listener. I mean, I know he's not putting that forward as like a very serious thing, but I'm like not even sure that quite gets to the point that I think he's trying to make. Maybe I don't understand it. Let me look at it again. Even here, the analysis will show there are possible inferences from a well-plotted speech that would startle the speaker who saw them beforehand. This is a general truth about words that excite us, and a truth certainly known to the ancients. No tears in the speaker, no tears in the listener. Hmm. Okay, well, I don't want to waste everybody's time thinking about that too much. The fourth lecture deals with the difficulty of... Oh, that was I just accidentally muted myself. <clears throat> the fourth lecture deals with... <laughs> <laughs> Thank God of applying our usual canons of responsibility to a poem that works like an oration or a formal apology, a poem that is in fact working to convince itself and its readers of a practical truth it cannot bear to specify. A poem trying to convince itself. I mean, I like this idea. When John Stuart Mill said that eloquence is heard, poetry is overheard, he made no allowance for those occasions when a poet talks himself into an impassioned and influential attitude on a public question and consents to be overheard by readers while he does so. I mean, isn't that kind of what all of Twitch is? I know I'm being very ridiculous by making that comparison, but like you're kind of hoping to be overheard in this kind of, in the new public forums that we have where most often your audience kind of like trickles in if one is, one appears at all, like you don't really, we, we tend to still imagine like the moment of speeches, you, you begin with an audience. Like now you gotta, the audience has got to come. The audience has got to find you. <clears throat> and that's, um, that, that creates this kind of weird dynamic. I think that changes it from this classical imagination of, of speech of like there, everyone is ready to stand up on the rostrum or whatever it might be. Um, but anyway, that's too far-fetched. The practical influence of a literary work as the cause of an effect that goes beyond attitude may call into question our usual ideas about aesthetic distance and the separation between the aesthetic and the ethical. It may. We may find it hard to avoid the conclusion that the artist has done something wrong with words. Now, here's a little other kind of academic um, shit-eating thing that's happening here. When someone says, we may find it, they're saying, you should find it after you read my piece. When language is both imaginative and persuasive, its meanings can't be confined within the limits that grammarians and critics like to set. This may still be the case when we are intensely conscious of our wish to control the range of our meanings. Burke's inquiry into the sublime and beautiful compares a verbal description to a painting in order to convince us that the painting, just because it produces visible effects, is less effective than words at raising strong emotions. Words are superior, paradoxically, says Burke, because they yield a more obscure image of their object. Wouldn't we think that the this is a very good way to go to bed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for stopping by at all, Steve. And the VOD will appear later if you really want to continue. But I think this is a good piece. It's been fun having you here. So thanks for uh, stopping by. Words are superior paradoxically, says Burke. Right. So <clears throat> the idea that something is more persuasive because it's more obscure, that it's less vivid, I think strikes us as, as, as strange at first. But think about all of the examples of like, 
when you, you know how sometimes you have the like motion on some new TVs. My TV doesn't have it, but I was recently at home uh, with my parents and they have a TV that has this like motion blur effect on that, you know, maybe when you're watching a sports game it makes it feel like more realistic. But if you turn it on during like a movie or something, it makes it look really uncanny and bad. It makes it look cheap. Like it makes it look too clear, too real. And um, I think that's an example of why sometimes, yeah, actually you need some of that. You need some of that little bit of decay away from like the perfect representation, like the perfect digital rendering of the object to get a feeling for it. And people have this feeling about lots of um, other kinds of aesthetics that you might be familiar with. In video games, there are a lot of people that prefer the lo-fi aesthetic. Is it because they're nostalgic for it from their childhood? Maybe. That's part of it. But there are certainly people that who never had it in their childhood that are younger that are still liking that aesthetic because it gives you a way of feeling into things that it might be not as available if things are kind of fully explicit, fully rendered out. It's all right there. You're not as much a participant as you were before. But even a verbal description uh, on this view wants to be picture-like. It is trying for sharp definition, and that is the problem. The problem I mean for someone interested in raising strong emotions. Draw out the observation a little further, and Burke will seem to be implying that great effects are incompatible with any stretch of words that pleases too much by being merely accountable. So if you do the dragnet style and say just the facts, and you just tell me what's happening, you're, there's no way you can be moving that way. Even if the thing that you're describing should make us feel a way. You know, you might be describing something really awful, and we should feel sad. But if, you go, if you're telling me about, like, the size, like, the dimensions of the tumor, it's, it can make me harder to feel that way. Like, oh, it's a little too vivid. Yeah? In fact... Burke makes an inference still more radical when he resumes the comparison of word and picture in the final part of the inquiry. Here his declared subject is words. Imagine if you wrote just like a chapter of a book called Words. Ridiculous. You wouldn't do this anymore. We rely on words as universals, he says, and so thoroughgoing is this reliance that words may shed all pretense of referring precisely to anything. On this account, the passage from designation to abstraction is hardly conscious. The frequent failure of words to deliver the literal value they promise or the literal help we wrongly expect of them turns out to be a perverse convenience for the imagination. The sounds being often used without reference to any particular occasion. Without reference to any particular occasion? Okay, anyway, that's his special meaning for me. So sorry if you're the one person <laughs> that's here. Uh, yay. I have to go find that. And carrying still their first impression, they at last utterly... Oh my gosh, my nose is so itchy. <clears throat> but I did get a negative COVID test. Just have an itchy nose. They at last utterly lose their connection with the particular little occasions that gave rise to them. The gradual process of dissociation over time, which turns apt metaphors into dead metaphors, works also to turn referring, referring into non-referring literalisms. So this is an argument that's kind of been made a lot. Maybe the first place that I encountered it was with Nietzsche in his essay, on truth and lies in a non-moral sense, where he says basically all language begins as metaphor. He, he said, really actually says all language is a mobile army of metaphors that it never loses its metaphorical qualities. You just forget about it. You forgot the metaphor. That's what makes it literal. That's all. <clears throat> we feel no cause for alarm since it is open to us to check the worth of the signals by other means. Detectable tones of voice, acquaintance with the speaker, and so on. Nothing, this is more from Burke on words, is an imitation further than as it, further than as it resembles some other thing. Nothing is an imitation further than as it resembles some other thing. And words undoubtedly have no sort of resemblance to the ideas for which they stand. So the word chicken doesn't look like a chicken. Obviously, just because words are unmeaning in this sense, they are well fitted to convey a strong charge of irregular passion. So we yield, our, yield ourselves to the sympathy evoked by words. We yield for better and also for worse. But a master of persuasion who recognizes this truth must accept the uncertainty of success in achieving a desired effect from words. So you can like understand how language can become persuasive and that it produces effect. You're still not going to be able to control those effects. It's like too powerful. It would be kind of like 
if you could only do chemistry in the way that alchemists used to do chemi- chemistry. Like before, like you're not able to reduce down all of the elements and all of the compounds into simple solutions that you can then combine. You, like they come already combined. So something might have a bunch of stuff in it that's going to react with a bunch of other stuff. And you might want one of those reactions, but you're going to get all of them, right? That, that might be a way to think about how language is different than <clears throat> some kind of scientific parceling out of all these different effects. Not possible. Burke, in his own rhetorical practice, was particularly anxious about that uncertainty. And in his speech on Fox's East India Bill, in the middle of his attack on the commercial empire of the East India Company, he paused to wonder at the way a vivid description of cruelty might counteract the proper effects of sympathy. It has been said, and with regard to one of them, with truth, that Tacitus and Machiavel, by their cold way of relating enormous crimes, have in some sort appeared not to disapprove them, but that they seem a sort of professors of the art of tyranny, and that they corrupt the minds of their readers by not expressing the detestation and horror that naturally belong to horrible and detestable proceedings. So, because Machiavelli can talk in a cool voice about... um, state violence sounds like he's a supporter of it you don't you can't be neutral so if you're not horrified you're in support you are a professor of tyranny professors of the art of tyranny i'd like to take that class <clears throat> strong disapproval does attach to such crimes as we experience or witness them but owing to the uncertainty of words and our non-moral curiosity regarding new objects the natural operation of the emotions is suspended when fascinating atrocities are impartially recounted We do not quite know what we are feeling then. I think he's trying to say a lot of things there, but... um, I'd give other examples, but I feel like maybe you can supply your own. One can find a related thought in Burke's letter of November 1789 to Charles-Jean-François de Pont, the most French name ever, the letter that was the germ of Reflections on the Revolution in France. Burke had hesitated to send it, he tells his young correspondent in France, because in seasons of jealousy, suspicion is vigilant and active. And if the authorities intercepted the letter, they might piece together indications that could be used against its recipient. In the ill-connected and inconclusive logic of the passions, whatever may appear blamable is easily transferred from the guilty writer to the innocent receiver. It is an awkward as well as an unpleasant accident, but it is one that sometimes happens. A man may be a martyr to the tenets of the most opposite to his own, right? So if you send someone, let's say you send someone a saucy, a rather saucy text. Now, even if they didn't want to receive it, if they open it in front of their grandma, you know, she's going to be like, what are you doing? Who, what are you, where have you been hanging out with, right? She's going to be like, so something like that is what he might be talking about. <laughs> This is prudent advice, and the matter might seem to end with the warning to take care. But coming from an author who had written earlier and emphatically of the non-resemblance between words and ideas, Burke's excuse for the delay in sending his message implies a more general warning. A writer, any writer, may be made the cause of conversions he did not intend. A work may be made a martyr to purposes the most opposite to those it declares on its face. And this not from any lack of competence in delivering an esoteric message but rather because of the fallibility of persuasion itself. And in a weird way, it's one of the ways that I can sleep at night because if my job is to, in some sense, help people become more persuasive, I'm not sure that I'm very good at my job. Maybe I am. You're the judge. Well, what if they are persuasive in ways that are bad? Of course, the world's not that simple. And one can have some faith that language that is really effective will become persuasive for its best ends if when given a broad enough scope. Do I believe that? I think that I, I think that I might. Wow, I'm really perverted. Okay, such skepticism about the intended path and the actual destination of words is not a modern discovery. It was known to Longinus as well as Burke, and Cicero seems aware of the danger when in De Oratore he cites Demosthenes on the most important parts of narration, delivery, delivery, and delivery, or, which is actually kind of important to note, given the theme of this whole book, which would be in Latin, actio, actio, actio. Action, action, action. Delivery is action. So, We think about words as separate than action. But here, in Latin, 
Action is the speaking. That is the action. Yeah? Or you could say the acting. Lots of ambiguities. <clears throat> he means that you can always make the same words mean different things. He means that you can always make the same words mean different things. He means that you can always make the same words mean different things. You get the idea? Still, it is relatively rare for scholars of rhetoric to keep their eyes fixed on this uncertainty. From the 18th century through the early 20th, it was widely, though not universally, supposed that poetry should accomplish something def definite and controllable, with assured effects of the sort I'm suggesting rhetoric can never obtain. You find this assumption in some unlikely places. G. Lowe's Dickinson, in The Greek View of Life. Again, again these references, just like the hoariest, dustiest, just most patrician, you know, you, this is like this is like all of the reading lists that you leave from like the worst office hours of all time. Like, could you help me understand a little bit better what you're talking about in class? Be like, just read J. Lowe's Dickinson's The Greek View of Life and return next week promptly at 3 p.m. Spoke for just such a rational didactic result when discussing the effects of catharsis on the audience of Greek tragedies. It worked, he thought, like a repeatable conversion that carried people from one state of mind to another. Melody, rhythm, gesture, and words were all consciously adapted to the production of a single precisely conceived emotional effect. The listener was in a position clearly to understand and appraise the value of the mood excited in him. Instead of being exhausted and confused by a chaos of vague and conflicting emotion, he had the sense of relief which accompanies the deliverance of a definite passion and returned to his ordinary business purged, as they said, and tranquilized by a process which he understood, directed to an end which he approved. I mean, this is a really patronizing view of an audience, being like, they just need to be told what to feel. But, um, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not, not very captivating vision there, but... A lot of people think this way. Notice the emphasis here on deliverance of a definite passion, which must mean at once being allowed to experience a great and piercing emotion and being relieved of a dangerous and intolerable emotion. Aristophanes and the frogs doubted the efficacy of any such attempted ameliorative therapy in the arts, making people better through art. The Dionysius of that satire judges a contest between the best lines offered by Euripides and Aeschylus. These are the two great Greek tragedians. One's kind of the new school, that's Euripides, and Aeschylus is old school. Euripides puts forward the sentence, Skill in speech is persuasion's inner shrine. Aeschylus responds, Death is the sole god who cannot be bought. <laughs> you know, so he's got like a little heavier, a little emo, a little uh, goth. When Dionysius pronounces Aeschylus the winner, Euripides is baffled. What did he do wrong? Dion Dionysus he did, he did change it between Dionysius and Dionysus. Okay, not just me. The answer is that Aeschylus won because he threw in death the heaviest of evils. But says Euripides, I threw in persuasion and made an adorable verse. Dionysus settles the argument with a warning. Persuasion's a tricky bodiless affair. Come, look through your plays. You must find something solid. And it's true. Persuasion is a tricky and bodiless affair. Now, a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. <clears throat> bodiless part, but um, we're going to give him some poetic license here, I think, on that one too. Common sense affords a clear enough idea of our reasons for using words to communicate. We want to be sociable and to be understood. Reductionist accounts of meaning come from supposing that those reasons explain more than they do. An author, it is said, produces words that intend a certain sense and effect. A reader of the sort the author had in view understands and rightly interprets those words, and their sense is approved or admired in accordance with that understanding. Right? Everything is moving along cleanly and clearly. Words are thereby used to satisfy an implicit contract, an agreement on the terms of proper understanding, which author and reader might both recognize if they were once spelled out. The great biographical critics in English, Johnson and Ruskin among them, show throughout their practice of what an impressive hold this picture exerted on readers of the 18th and 19th centuries. I would say, in a large sense, also in the 21st century. The view of the purposive adequacy of language derives ultimately from Aristotle's rhetoric. Persuasion is valued there for its conveyance of, a, of situated judgment and deliberative partiality. I borrow the phrases from Brian Garston's excellent study of rhetoric and political thought, saving persuasions. Persuasion. 
<clears throat> Aristotle believed rhetoric could be a technical art of deliberation, writes Garston, insofar as it studied the internal structure of public opinion, looking for deliberative pathways between various beliefs and emotions. The rhetoric describes four such pathways in order may follow to plant conviction as listeners. Okay, now, I do want to check how much longer this chapter goes on because I don't want to be here all night. No offense, stream chat. Um, might be able to do this as a two-parter. I think that is not a bad place to actually stop. We're about to go into what rhetoric says about all of this. <clears throat> and um, what might be, what rhetoric might need to think about maybe a little bit differently. But anyway, I think having read pretty closely and aloud, reading things aloud is such an such a strange practice because it seems very old, but it feels, when I do it here, very, very modern to do it online on twitch.tv slash rhetoric broth follow me or like and subscribe on youtube on my youtube channel it feels very modern and um it's funny there's lots of stories i don't know how true they are i actually think they probably are there's some truth to them that in the ancient world people had to learn how to to read silently that they would have like unscroll a scroll and then they would start kind of whispering like you don't really naturally know how to read in your head. So that reading aloud might be helpful because some of those moments where you have to deliver a lot, you have to make a choice about how to say it, you're also making a choice about what it means that you might miss or skip over that kind of choice that maybe a greater nuance you might have if you had to read it aloud. So one thing I would say is if you really struggle with reading or if reading is not something that you like too much and maybe you feel more drawn to audiobooks, that might not be because you aren't good at reading or you don't like reading. It might be because the modality of reading that everyone has adopted as the main way that you read, which is quietly, might not be the most interesting or best one for you. So you might try to read aloud yourself because I find it really helps me understand a work, get a new sense of it, what it means to me. And every time I do it, um, I always notice new things in a good work, in a work that has some depth to it, some quality to it. Um, but yeah, hopefully that you enjoyed this, uh, this restart to the stream, getting ready for the next semester and going back to the dream that I began with thinking about it. Why was I lost? What was I looking for? I was looking for the class. I was like, where is the class? And rather than think about that as like, where's the classroom? Because in the dream, there was no classroom. There never was. I didn't dream one. It wasn't there. But the question of where is the class is like a good question to have all of the time. Like, where is the class? Is it here with me on this Twitch stream right now? Or is it with you watching this Twitch stream? Figuring out what the hell is this all about? Where is the class? So maybe my dream put me on the right path, even though it was a dream about being lost. Thanks once again for hanging out and... Um, Tune in next time here on the Rhetoric Prof stream for more weird nonsense like this. See you later.